Here's something you know, and you can put on camera. My name is Lisa Johnson. My husband's name is David. I have two small sons named Jordan and Zach. We had a perfect marriage, or so I thought. Three years ago, I became seriously ill and was put into the hospital. After 15 long, painful days, my husband finally gave me the news that I thought was the ruin of my life, but actually turned out to be the greatest gift a believer could ever receive. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. What David had to say was, quote, For the last five out of the six years of our marriage, I have functioned as a homosexual. I got AIDS, and now I have given it to you. Well, you can only imagine the anguish of grief and fear that beset me. God stepped in immediately, and he made it impossible to do what I would normally do. David said he was packed and ready to leave on my command, and he was prepared to admit me to a psychiatric ward of another hospital to help me deal with the situation. I lifted my head as I would sit, and I said, under no circumstances will we go for psychiatric counseling. That's a satanic counterfeit that will lead us to believe that you were born this way. No, this is sin. And, I'm not, and I am going to forgive you. And if you still want to, I'll stay with you and God with the situation. Well, David was just shocked. We went home, and for the next few months, I read scripture to him every day. He continued to see the man which he had been having an affair with. This was so unlike me to permit this, but God in his infinite wisdom made me do it. Finally, as the word began to set in, you could see David turn around spiritually. The light came back on, and as David was ready, I was allowed to say, David, you do know that you can't have us both, don't you? He was grief-stricken, as he truly believed he loved and pitied this dying man with whom he had related for five years. But by God's grace and strength, he did it. I won't say it was the easy. It was easy because it wasn't. On the other hand, it was the easiest thing I've ever done in my life. All I did was wake up every morning, allow myself to be used, and then went to bed at night. The Lord did everything else. The hard part was that I had to suffer tremendously in the process. John 15, 2 says, Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it, that it may bear more fruit. It never says how long and painful the pruning can be. First came a test of jealousy. It was awful. David became a dog on a leash. Then to test of fear. No one could know because they would hate and fear us. It was only, it, pardon me, it was such a lonely test for the first 13 months. The only ones to know were the couple that we selected to raise our boys. They were a great help, but not enough. So I went through the valley of the shadow of death, the kind of no man's land. Only God could help me, and he did. He used music. It was supernatural, the perfect blend of knowledge and emotional response. I praised him in my soul and with my broken body as I had never before. Then came the test of suffering. We made it. Out of the most recent hospitalization where I experienced a taste of death that alleviated all my fears, I came home a changed person. God had performed so many miracles in those 15 days that I could never doubt him again. I would never get, uh, give in to fear again. Help thou my unbelief, says Mark 9, 24. I had 1,000 days of fear and suffering, and he was about to change all of that. I began to feel that he was treating me like a personal friend. I had previously believed the miracles and testimonies of others, but now I was experiencing them firsthand. They can't cure AIDS. So they are working on the diseases that eventually kill the aged patient, patients, one of which is a special form of pneumonia. On the day I went to the hospital with that pneumonia, the cure for it was released. I take that personally. After I came home from the hospital, the Lord led me to make it completely public. I was so ashamed that for 1,000 days I had worried and mistrusted my Lord, 
and not one person failed to forgive us and take the two of us into their carry arms. Praise God, the joy was overwhelming. Psalm 84.10 says, For a day in thy courts, O Lord, is better than one thousand outside. And it was true. Now comes the test that he has made his joy complete in me. John 15.11 I need my resurrection body to handle this much happiness. It almost hurts. I've asked the Lord to back it off as my cup is running over. Now I am dealing with the irrational fears of others. I can handle it because they can never match the fears I've already experienced. I trust him completely now. And the results, well, I wrote the enclosed document and its use around the nation has been awe-inspiring to me. Uh, men like Gene Cunningham in Conway, Arkansas and Sonny Shimoa in uh, Kailua, Hawaii have read it to their congregations and have had several people saved. Many claim their marriages were restored and others report that their lives are changed forever. The power of God is overwhelming to me. I've written a book entitled, Be Ye Glad, What Else? My purpose in writing to you is because God has motivated David and me to take this tribute to his glory to other churches around the nation. By 1991, the most medical experts predict the widespread explosion of the AIDS virus in all of our nation's communities. Traditionally, the church has always been there for the human race in times of plague. In the word, they were called the parabolami, or the ones who play the gambler. Once again, we have an opportunity to glorify our Lord Jesus Christ by overcoming our own fears to give aid and comfort to those who are suffering and dying. God has given David and me a mission of helping to lay the groundwork in our churches. When the church suddenly discovers AIDS among its own, it is startled into its into action. We offer ourselves to your church for an hour or so of speaking and encouragement. Please consider presenting this offer to your congregation for consideration and prayer. We believe that God will open the doors and supply the financial needs for the ministry. Uh, regardless of your decision, please give us the privilege of your prayer support. If you'd like more information, you can call, and if you wish recommendations, call Gene Cunningham or Bob Braddock in Puyallup, Washington. Please also pray for my good health and energy. I have a t-shirt that says, so much to say, <laughs> so little time. And that's how I feel about it. There's so little time to prepare for the scourge that's about to strike this nation. Remember Paul's command of the Corinthians, to be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Thanks for taking time to read the letter. And then this is the thing that she enclosed. I have to be able to see here. <laughs> In these days of confused situations, what could be a more confused situation? You're married and you're happy. You're secure. Suddenly you become critically ill and you're at the lowest and physically weakest point in your entire life. Instead of the comfort and healing of the one you love most, you receive the most painful blow of your life. He loves you, but he also loves someone else. He would never hurt you, but he's killed you. He's ready to move out, but he doesn't think he wants to leave. He doesn't know anything anymore. And you feel like dying now. This is a confused situation. In these nights of restless remorse, after a heart has been broken, there comes a quiet time, a painful time, a time for grieving and being wounded. It's very lonely. But it's a time when the peace of God bathes you, numbs you, soothes you, and delicately he mends the broken heart. You must turn to God here. You must allow him to care for you. He makes the restless remorse to turn into a peace that passes understanding. Thank you, Father. <coughs> Ever since my crisis, I find myself looking into strange faces in public 
and asking them with my eyes, are you hurting too? Are you suffering too? I'm certainly not the only person who has ever been brokenhearted. When it hits this nation, we will be devastated. Tens of thousands of our young, productive people will be cut down in the prime of their lives. Children will lose their parents. Mothers will lose their sons. Fathers, their daughters. We will lose sisters, uncles, grandchildren, and friends. There will be a great mourning in the land. This will be very painful. God is so wonderful. He wouldn't consider asking me to suffer so unjustly without having shown me how through his own dear son. We deserve whatever we get. Jesus Christ was not guilty, but he willingly paid the penalty for all our sins. I can learn from him. He built the bridges I'm crossing now. Comes a song bringing joy to the sad. The good news of God to man is the only thing that gives me happiness. Grace reaching down to lift me up to truth. It's amazing. I've been broken. I've laid wounded. What causes my soul to rally is the hope that comes from knowing God and from believing that one day I will laugh all of this off as a present light affliction. Your cry has been heard. The secret to everything is prayer, not the believing in it, not just the talking about it, but the doing of it. The prayers I've prayed as far back as 19 years ago are now being answered. I have been crying out for years, and he was answering all along. He will never leave me nor forsake me. When I am faithless, he is still faithful. The ransom has been paid up in full. God is free to do everything for me because of what Christ did for me on the cross. The man I love is not guilty because of what my Lord did for us on the cross. The price for my sins had to be paid. I didn't have to pay it. Thank you, Father. How can I be anything else but glad? He saved my soul. He saved my marriage. He saved my husband. He saved my life. He allowed me to see the joy set before me so that I have gladly been able to endure my cross. I get to have inner happiness in a time when this is humanly impossible. This thing will break us financially. To my shame, we will have to depend on others for food, shelter, bills, medicine, doctors, visits, and so on and on and on. The human sacrifice on our behalf is amazing. We are indebted to so many for so much. We can never repay it, never. It's humiliating. It's humbling. The debt has been paid in full by the grace of the Lord. No, I can't repay my debts, but the Lord can. Every believer that gives me time, love, attention, financial support, strokes, hugs, prayers, patience, and so much more gets credit as though he had given those things to the Lord Jesus himself. If they do it to the least of these, they do it also for him. I love to think of the rewards in eternity waiting for those who have, been, who have given so much of themselves on account of me. Words cannot express the fullness in my soul. I can't believe I get to be glad. Now from, the, from your dungeon a rumor is stirring. We are like sheep for the slaughter. We are in the devil's world. I am a slave to my disease. I am a prisoner of my body until God calls me home. Spiritually I am a prisoner of war. Satan has his demons whispering in my ears. Their threats and innuendos permeate my dreams and my thoughts. They play on my fears. The demons try to convince me that this is a losing battle. They tell me it's not worth it. This isn't new to me. The demons have been attacking me since I was 11. They never seem to give up. At times they change their tactic, but their goal is always the same, to seek and to destroy. All of my life I have felt like I lost every battle. It's not because the demons beat me, it's because I defeated myself. I never took the fight seriously. Oh sure, I took it in, but I never made the effort to put it back out. The shortness of time has made the difference. I have to make A's, and I always wait until the last minute to prepare for the tests. 
Well, it's Sunday night, and I have a final exam in the morning. And outside there are faces of friends. They say, don't expect to have five good friends in your life. I have been truly blessed. Never have I known truer friends. Tragedy has a way of bringing the best out in people. My friends have supported me through dark times when I feared they would let me down. They showed me Christ. I never had much of a body before. I took it for granted. I wasn't graceful. Now I thank God for all the strength and good health I have left. I have felt myself deteriorate. My strength is diminished. I depend on others for simple chores that I used to complain about having to do. I'm losing my human dignity, and what I've already been through is absolutely nothing compared to what it's going to be. You can see this in the way I look at people. In my eyes is not a reflection of the suffering I've endured, but rather it's a reflection of the compassion God has given me by means of the sorrow I've experienced. I pray I will never let go of my understanding of what people go through in this life. Lord, let me look with compassion out of the eye, these eyes of mine. The very thing I've craved all my life, approval, is now coming to me in ways almost unbearable for me to handle. I'm enjoying a deep personal relationship with people who would have otherwise passed me over had they not known of my circumstances. I thank God that I have been so blessed in time. I haven't had to wait for eternity to reap the rewards of such love from people I respect the most. When life was more simple, I missed so much. The whole realm of human emotion has been opened to me. The Lord has revealed himself to me in ways I had only been told before. Now I have experienced him, and my faith and appreciation of him has been magnified. This has increased my capacity for real happiness. I want to let the light within me shine. If the world doesn't see God's grace in my life, then my life is in vain. When people look at me, I want them to be able to see past my flaws, my failures, my inabilities to cope, and in looking past my weaknesses, I want them to see the strength of Christ. Without him, I'm nothing. Oh, Father, let me be great in you. Please let my light shine. There's nothing so helpless as a ship out of control in the darkness of a storm, and that is my life. But like my Lord, I want to sleep peacefully and remain calm while others around me may be losing their heads. If God can save me from myself and see through the test, then he can and will do it for anyone else in his plan. I want to live in the eye of the hurricane. There's peace in the eye of the hurricane. I crave to be the person that people will come to for help. I never feel better than when I am useful to others. I pray to God to be used however he sees fit. I know this only comes from brokenness and humility. I feel sorry for the people who endure hardship and disease apart from the grace of God. How do they do it? I have Christ to run to. He sustains me. Let me show Christ to others as they look to me for help. I pray that this disease will humble this nation. It will bring us to our knees if we will only run into the hands of a living God. God could have overlooked me, but in his grace he bent down and brought me up to where he is. I'm so excited to get to play a part in God's plan. Left alone, I would have never gotten up off my spiritual rear to serve the Lord. I volunteered timidly, and by grace he chose to use me anyway. I'm impressed with the way that everything is coming together in my life. Things that happened when I was three are only now starting to make sense to fit into the big picture. Everything is working together for the good. My body, though only 30, is feeling old. I never will grow old, but I will still have to experience the decay and the slowing of my system. This is on the outside. On the inside of my soul is the excitement and the joy that only God can give. I would not change one single thing about this gift that God has given me. I would never have picked this test for myself 
But since God has chosen my path, I will walk in with my head held high and in his strength. There is nothing that can match the shame of putting AIDS on an arrogant Christian woman who has spent her life shunning the dregs of society. Now I have become the scum of the earth. I am the poor, the trash, the filth. I am lower than the lowest. And I didn't go there by choice. God forced me there. He bent me. He broke me. The test of a broken heart and the mantle of suffering placed upon me have forced me to the foot of the cross. From that close range, I can get a good, clear look at my example by Lord Jesus Christ. I want to be just like him when I grow up. God, I can't believe God is letting me do this. I love it. God, help me. I love it. Be ye glad. She's also written a song. Or not, she hasn't written it, but it's song written by Michael Kelly Blanchard, recorded by Glad on the a cappella project, a uh, label, and uh, it's just tremendous. Isn't that a testimony? I'd love to uh, see if something could be arranged with some of the other churches in the area to bring her out, bring them out in the area and have them speak to us. We just don't have money, you know that, to do anything like that. But isn't that something I tell you? AIDS, of all things.